All right, let's get started. Um, I want to thank everyone for logging in and joining us on, on today's uh, next session of MRA series of webinars. We've covered a number of topics in the last couple of weeks. Today, we will cover the very complicated issue of business interruption insurance. I know that this issue is, issue, this issue is one of the most common questions that we receive at the MRA. And today's panel will hopefully be able to guide us through uh, the number of situations that are happening both federally, locally, and in the court system. We want to thank all the operators for taking time out of their day to learn about this important issue and join us on this webinar. Uh, I want to remind you all that if you need to ask a question, please use the question and answer feature uh, down below, not the chat. The chat is very yeah, difficult to uh, moderate. Oh I just need you guys to complete. So please use the question and answer function to ask any questions and we will uh, ask those questions at a natural break or at the end. Um, this re webinar will be recorded and we will have it available on our website and for distribution uh, after it has completed. Uh, that having been said, uh, we are joined today by Mark Diller and his team. Mark Diller is a Boston attorney who has done um, some work with the Mass Restaurant Association recently and as they he and his team are experts on on this issue that we have in front of us and we look forward to hearing from them as uh, the webinar uh, navigates. So without any further ado, I will turn it over to Mark Diller. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for inviting us to be here and talk to everybody. I just wanted to uh, say we understand how devastated the restaurant industry has been uh, by the pandemic by the government's orders to shut down. And we know that we get asked all the time about can we recover for the lost business from our insurance policies. So we have a, a group of experts here that are handling these cases nationally, including here in Massachusetts. We're all working together on them. And my goal here today is to allow them to answer all questions. I'm going to turn to the group, have them introduce how this group of experts came together. I'm going to then go over some issues that you may have um, thoughts about or concerns about as it relates to your insurance policy and the loss of business. And then we're going to take questions and answers. So first, I'd like to introduce Jeff Korick, who is a trial lawyer out of New York, the past president of the New York State Trial Lawyers Association, one of the top trial lawyers in the country. He's a member of our group of experts, and he helped assemble this expert team. So I'd like to turn it over to him to introduce himself and tell us how he put this group together. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I know, uh, as Mark said, this has been devastating and it's personal and it's close to so many businesses and so many people who put so much of their blood, sweat and tears and their families and uh, their lives into businesses, paid premiums on all the right things. And then when it came time uh, to ask for the carriers to step up and provide coverage, they got a thousand reasons why uh, there's no coverage. Um, I've been doing personal injury medical malpractice work for over 30 years, um, and I saw this as an opportunity for our law firm to team up with, in my opinion, uh, two of the top guys um, that could help in this effort. Uh, Mark has been a tremendous introduction to so many others, as well as um, to the restaurant industry today, and we appreciate the introduction. Um, by including Mark, uh, Alan Cannon, who I've worked with before. Um, I was president of New York State Trial Lawyers Association. I think at the same time Alan was of the Louisiana State Trial Lawyers Association. Alan's an original New Jersey guy, uh, UPenn undergrad, Harvard Law School. Uh, brought the lawsuit on behalf of Louisiana against BP uh, in the British Petroleum case. Uh, represented the state of uh, New Jersey against Exxon. Andrew Finkelstein and his firm, uh, one of the top firms in New York, Someone else, I thought that uh, we could combine our efforts and our work together in the legislature in New York State uh, to make an impact and make legislators understand what some of our clients were going through, their constituents. And I thought by putting this team together that we would make, uh, uh, again, an impact uh, on getting carriers to step up and do the right thing. 
or to have us litigate against them uh, with the idea to get results for our clients. So again, Mark, uh, sorry to take so long. I appreciate the introduction and thanks again for allowing us to be here. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I'll give actually, Alan, do you wanna just introduce yourself briefly to the group and then I'll introduce Andrew to the group and then we'll go into, uh, I'll go into some of the topics. Sure, thanks. Uh, I've been doing um, business interruption for uh, really since the Three Mile Island. I represented Hershey's Chocolate. They denied their claim. Um, but I really got involved in this, uh, I think, mostly after Katrina. And Katrina was very different, but it, it devastated my community. And the notion that people had paid money for years and years, and yet the insurance companies were denying every claim. The federal tax, uh, you know, federal tax dollars were being used instead. Seemed to me to be the, the height of uh, absurdity. Um, we need to get, you know, the insurance is what you buy for that worst moment in your life, and and this is pretty much it. And uh, that's a sacred trust, you know, and that's why the insurance companies ought to be made to pay. And I think there are ways for them to be paid. I've never seen. You know, we did Katrina, I, uh, a lot of the Superstorm Sandy cases, and I have never seen a full court press by the insurance industry as, as I have here. Uh, they've had, uh, they sent letters directly to people en masse, regardless of what endorsements they have on policy, saying no coverage. They've had brokers saying no coverage, agents saying no coverage with no idea about what's you know inside that policy. And I think it's just outrageous. So I'm happy to be here. Great. Thanks, Alan. <laughs> Andrew, who's uh, my partner here in Massachusetts too, he's in my firm. Um, I'm gonna introduce Andrew Finkelstein, just introduce yourself to the group. Uh, there you go, Andrew Finkelstein. Let's kind of get right to brass tacks. All I'm right. going to dive right in because everybody here is busy. Uh, no disrespect to anybody else, but let me so, let me di let me dive right in, Mark. Yeah, uh, please. What whatever what you're hearing, and I just want to to set the stage for where we're going to go with this, which is the distinction between a first party claim and what other typical claims that you think your insurance is for when somebody sues you. So. Uh, when you hear Alan talk about Katrina, BP, Ike, and Hershey with Three Mile Island, this is where one party contracts with another party to get, they buy a benefit. That's all an insurance policy is. That's what's called a first party claim. Why do I start at such a foundational level? Because the contract controls. The language in the contract controls what you bought and what you didn't buy. This is not a legal presentation, so I'm not going to talk about all these various legal theories, but understand simply this. When the person who writes the contract, they have an obligation to write it in clear and unambiguous language. If that language is not clear or it's ambiguous, the contract is interpreted against the person who wrote the contract. So everybody who's watching this right now has a contract with your insurance company that was drafted by your insurance company. If that contract is not clear, they lose. That's kind of just a broad principle everybody should understand. So just because it may say um, a virus exclusion they will hold that up and say, hey, look, it says a virus exclusion. But if that language is not clear, or there are other areas within the policy that provide for coverage, even though they may have excluded virus exclusion, but you bought civil authority coverage, meaning if the state says you must shut down, then you have coverage in that area. I, I just wanted to really explain in a foundational level, this is a contract claim. And it's you are a contracting party, you paid your premiums, and now you're entitled to the benefits for what you purchased. It will be controlled by your contract. Unfortunately, the four of us can't give you a quick answer 
whether you have coverage or you don't have coverage because every contract, even though it's an insurance policy, business contracts are written differently. There's 6,000 different insurance companies across the country. They all use different forms. They all have different language. So it's, it's, a, it's a process of reading the contract, which you don't have to do. That's something that we're happy to do. We can read the contract. Uh, I'm, I'm actually going to take half a step back. Sorry, Mark. I'm just going to kind of move yeah, through this because I'm trying to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, one, and, and Jeff and Alan jump in at any time. But one thing I want everybody who's watching this to understand, there are certain obligations. It's a contract. And it outlines what you need to do to trigger their responsibility to pay right? That's important for everybody to understand. What is that trigger? Nothing happens until you put a claim in. And it's not as simple as calling up your broker, do I have coverage? No, I don't have coverage. And that's the end of it. You don't want to be in a scenario where you're fighting that that was the claim that you made. Uh, you need to, uh, everybody should make a formal claim. What is that? Put it in writing, and we're happy to help you draft that if you haven't done it already. But put it in writing in some in substance that says, I want all the benefits of the contract that I purchased. Provide it for me. The obligation, and, and it's not as limited as that, but I'm just for illustration purposes. Now the obligation is on the insurance company to say whether you actually are entitled to those benefits or not. And if you're not, they have a duty to clearly and fully explain, it's called a denial, why they're denying your claim. But nothing will ever happen if you don't put a claim in. That's what triggers their duty to act. Once you get that denial, then we can evaluate whether or not there's a meritorious claim that we can force them to pay. Because that's what's going to happen. Not one carrier, and we've done this for hundreds of, of different restaurants and businesses across the country. Not one insurance company, surprisingly, came up and said, hey, let me give you all the money we, you're entitled to. It's the exact opposite. They are all holding on to your money that you're entitled to. So... The first thing you need to do is file that claim. That'll trigger the active. Now, here's one question that we always get. Well, isn't that going to increase my insurance premiums? Aren't I going to lose money by filing this claim? The simple answer is no. You contracted and you have an obligation to put them on notice of when you believe you're entitled to something. Just to say you believe you're entitled to benefits under your contract, does not give the insurance company the right to penalize you. All they do is say, no, you're wrong. We don't think you're entitled to it. It's the next step of starting the lawsuit and pursuing it and recovering. Um, we could, we could kind of talk about that at the end, but that's, you're going to be in a good position. If they're looking to increase your premiums, that means you've collected a lot of money. Okay. And that's when you go shopping for another carrier, by the way. But, um, so step one is put the claim in. Step two is see what the denial is in relationship to the totality of the policy. Because what we have found, the four of us, is that claims are, uh, denials are coming back where uh, just hypothetically, if there are 10 paragraphs, they say, oh, you don't have coverage because of paragraph two. And they're silent about paragraph seven. And what is paragraph seven? Another avenue for coverage. Just because they deny it in paragraph two doesn't mean it denies it in the whole contract. If there's another avenue of coverage because you paid a premium for paragraph seven, which says we will pay, they have to pay. So what we're finding is insurance companies are only highlighting where they don't have to pay and ignoring where we believe they do have to pay. So, um, that's an analysis that we're happy to undergo for you. Uh, and I'm going to kind of jump right to the bottom line of what a lot of people always ask is, well, what does that cost? It doesn't cost anything. All the four of us work on a contingency. Contingency is very simply, we only get paid if we win. If we don't win, you never write a check to us. You owe us nothing. We 
take cases when we believe we will be successful. Just like you, we're also business people and we're going to get into a business situation when we think we'll be successful. And we're going to be brutally honest with you right up front. We think we can make a valid claim for you. We're going to tell you. If we think that we can't make a claim, we're also going to tell you. So um, we do that and we turn that around uh, pretty quickly. So that's my uh, quick uh, nine minute big picture business interruption. We could drill down to more details um, and we're happy to. Uh, why don't I do this? Alan, you wanna talk about some of the different uh, theories between business interruption, civil authority, and extra expense provisions and policies that we've been seeing? Um, sure. Um, you know, those provisions? Yes. Um, I, I just want to uh, say one thing as a, as a prelude to that uh, on provisions. Um, I, I have settled actually two cases, one for a million and another partial settlement for a hundred thousand for restaurants uh, last week. And um, what was key in those cases was that they had the restaurant endorsement, um, which often has communicable disease coverage and often has, uh, or has definitions of food contamination, et cetera. Why is that important? Okay, the reason it's important is courts will not let you take uh, something like business interruption and say um, you have to pay on, on, on it without any precondition. The way the co most contracts are written, it says you've got to have a um, physical loss of or damage to property. And most of you have been denied, or if you've been denied, will be denied on that basis. Now, what is the property damage? Um, you know, I had the experience in Massachusetts talking to um, an adjuster, and uh, I said, well, you know, the Massachusetts courts have ruled that that language is ambiguous, and as Andrew said, has to be construed in favor of coverage. She goes, well, I don't, I don't know that. I didn't know that. I said, well, we'd find a lawyer in their company and tell them that this is Massachusetts, and it's a little bit different than it is in some other states. Um, I think the, the, the law is very good there. So to get that business interruption, you have to have a pro uh, property loss. What is the property loss? Loss of use as a result of the emergency orders. Most, most restaurateurs who I talk to will all say, you know, it, it, wasn't the, it wasn't the virus that caused my problems. It was these orders from government. And that's the, you know, and sometimes the truth really does set you free. I mean, that's the argument you make on property, and you can make that argument in Massachusetts. Other states, it's tougher, it's, you know, it's sort of a jump off. Courts have accepted the idea that you don't need structural damage as physical loss, though most of these denial letters they send out pretend like it has to be um, a structural damage. Now, there's a lot of cases, including cases in Massachusetts, that say the imminent risk of harm is enough. If most of you look at your policy, what they're protecting is the risk of harm. Um, so you get, you get over the property. So on the property piece, which is a huge piece and triggers all the other coverages to some extent, um, yeah, it, it generally does, ex except if you've got the, the, that restaurant endorsement language, uh, which they always poo-poo uh, in their denial letters. But, uh, um, you know, if your lawyers are pushing back, sometimes somebody high enough up hears about it and, and you know, things start to move. So that's how you get around property loss. Um, loss of use, it works in Massachusetts. Um, it opens up business interruption. Business interruption is basically, um, uh, there's usually a limit in your policy. Though some, some policies say 12 months, all loss sustained, so it means a monetary figure. Uh, probably the gold standard would be 12 to 24 months, all losses sustained, and then you have a variety of ways you can calculate your, your losses. And if you have a lawyer who's experienced in insurance, they can help you maximize your coverage um, un under your policy, given the, the precise language of, of the policy. Um, so that's important. 
And Alan, can I, can I, I just want to supplement to that. One thing that we, a question that we always get is, do I have to have a total loss of use or a total loss in my business? I'm still doing uh, takeout. I'm still doing uh, curbside delivery, things like that. You want to address that? Yeah. Uh, in fact, the defendants always, uh, I mean, the insurance companies always bring that up. They say, well, you know, you, you're selling stuff out the door. You, you may be, a, you know, uh, um, and you know, I filed a complaint in um, Florida recently, and and what I did was I, you, you got to talk to the owners. I mean, what are you selling? You're you're not selling takeout. You're selling an atmosphere. You're you're selling a mood. You're charging a premium price because of you know the kind of operation you're running, and all of that has to be laid out. And most of these policies will say that. Uh, specifically say that it doesn't have to be a total suspension uh, of, of use, a, a slowdown. Uh, the standard policies usually say a slowdown is enough, but I think it's important, um, you know, I, I just talked a little bit about law a second ago, but the facts are always important. And, and you've, you've got to identify the business. And as Andrew says, I, I, impl implicitly, you know, we have, it's our job to see the pitfalls and to see what, what rocks they're going to throw at our case and to anticipate those by trying to draw out um, um, damages uh, as, as well as possible. But for most people, except those of you who own a Sonic or something with a drive through it's been very hard on, on takeout. But it's not just the order on what you can do. You know, you've got these stay-at-home orders also, which are telling people to not come out um, as much. And um, I think that was a huge, huge uh, factor. So, so unless the policy is limited to just a total and complete shutdown, um, I think you're okay. And I'll note that uh, a lot of policies, when they talk about physical damage in terms of the commercial general liability portion, uh, of the policy always referred to things like loss of use or loss of partial use as part of their physical damage. And I think you can go to a court and say, hey, that's part of how we understand this contract. As, as Andrew was saying earlier, it, it's not just, uh, I, I wanna just go one, one step further on that. It's, it's not just the contract, okay? There is a whole body of rights that you have at variance with the contract that have to be read in tandem with it. Uh, Andrew gave a good example, ambiguities. Ambiguities are construed in favor of coverage. Okay? It doesn't say that in the policy, but you know, people who work with policies know that, and that's how you, you work through these things. So on, on business interruption, I think that um, uh, you, you know, a, the fact that there was limited utility um you know I, you know I, you know i know restaurants some people have three or four restaurants you know three are totally shut down and maybe they're doing takeout at one uh just because you know managers are still on payroll and you know that they'll staff it but that's that's about it oh, oh and by the way on business income very important point um hopefully most of you got some ppp money okay after Katrina, the insurance companies came back and said, oh, we should get a credit for the money you got from government grants. You know, so if I owe you, you know, 100000 and you got a $20,000 grant, you, I only have to give you eighty. They wanted an offset from taxpayers. The courts rejected that totally. Um, and I'm confident that they will do the same here, though, um, uh, in terms of uh, cal calculating business income. Uh, so if you've recovered money, um, don't view it as an offset. Um, they're allowed to ask you about it, but um, I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't worry about it too much, um, uh, at least based on, on the existing case law. So, so then you've got civil authority. Civil authority uh, is one of those uh, benefits that deals with access to your property. Okay, and, and this is sort of about access to property, but it's a little bit different from classical uh, civil authority. Also, unlike business interruption, which goes to the full limit of a policy, usually um, civil authority is a sublimit. 
uh, that I have limit monetarily, it's, or they'll say, if your business income, let's just say hypothetically, you got 12 months ALS, all losses sustained, uh, civil authority may be three weeks of coverage, um, which for most businesses in most restaurant tours is too little because you know you're losing money longer than that um that's really kind of the second place prize but it does deal with the situation of denial of access to property um and the fact that it's in a policy is good now in the old days it'd be like the building next door you know uh, collapsed so they were worried about your building collapsing because of subsidence or something and so they had these limited little periods of time um, uh, or your building was found by an inspector not to be appropriate and uh, so that they, they shut you down, the fire marshal shut you down, that would be a loss of access as well, um, that possibly under some policies you could recover on, it may not be the best example of fire marshal, but, um, you know, both of those are going to be limited coverage situations, and then you have to say that there was a loss that there was a physical damage someplace else, or you suffered it. And in effect, it's the government order. Um, I, I think that you should look at civil authority as your fallback position in these cases. In, in the first instance, if you can find the path to coverage, a reasonable path to coverage under Massachusetts law that lets you open up the entire business interruption, I think that's your that's what you should do. Now, there's uh, Andrew also asked about extra expense. Most people have business income. It's usually business income plus extra expense, uh, or usually extra expense is added by by one of the uh, they're called time element extensions. For some reason, instead of just saying the amount of days that you weren't making money, it's it's called a time element uh, in a lot of these policies, and sometimes. It's, extra expenses added in there with a few other things. Uh, extra expense are the dollars you spend to um, get, okay, so before the emergency orders went out, this is your baseline of operations, uh, and they usually do a year-over-year -year analysis. Um, so what were you making last year in March? What did you make this year in March? Um, so the extra expense is what helps get you back to that baseline um, of recovery. And uh, that's a whole host of things, cleaning products. I know some people have, have put up plastic dividers in their establishments to give people a feeling of extra uh, security or, or protection, uh, which I think is, is part of it right now. Uh, all of that gets covered under extra expense. It usually runs until that period of restoration, until you're back to um, sort of the pre-COVID-19 uh, world, if you will. Um, there'll be a lot of fights, I suspect, down the road. But right now, you can, you can only really recover your losses up until this point or up until your limit of your policy. But there may be fights down the road about uh, how long this period lasts. Uh, some insurers say, oh, tastes are changing. Nobody wants to go out to a restaurant anymore. And that's really the cause of loss, not the government order that started this whole spiral. So it's complicated. It's good to have people you work with who, who do this every day. Because <laughs> uh, cause there are, uh, you know, it, 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 can, it can get very complicated. Yeah, I just want to I, I just want to highlight one thing, which is uh, that your contract con controls when your insurance contract controls what duty and obligation you have from a time standpoint to put the insurance company on notice and you don't want to miss that time so uh there there are always ways to fight that but who needs to fight that we have a lot of other things to fight whether you gave what's called timely notice. So I would encourage everybody who is watching this, if you have not given notice as of yet, do so today or tomorrow, um, because then you you'll, should still be within the window. It all depends on which uh, government order uh, would be referred back to. But a lot of, some policies are as soon as possible. Some are within 90 days of, an event, uh, some are, each one is different, uh, but you just don't want to miss that time. So get that claim letter in if you haven't, uh, and then expect the denial. 
Um, but then after that denial comes in, uh, sometimes they give a what's called a partial denial, and they'll start asking for some things. I one if they start asking, you have an obligation to provide it. That's just the very broad principle. Um, don't ignore it. Don't say, hey, they denied my claim, so I'm not giving them anything. That would put you in a uh, bad footing. You need to still comply so that you uh, put you in a position to fight that denial and to get those benefits. Can somebody talk about what's the strategy that we intend to employ once a denial comes in to the restaurant and they need to actually fight to get coverage? Well, that's first is to have a discussion with their adjuster directly, just to see if uh, how how serious are you about that denial uh, in substance, uh, and if it's clear that there's no way, no how that they will um, make a voluntary offer, then we start a lawsuit. There's really no other alternatives, and. Uh, we commence litigation and there, there are hundreds and hundreds of these cases that are being filed throughout the country. Uh, there are different types of cases that are being filed, individual cases based on individual clauses on an individual policy. There are class action cases that are being filed where one person who is a customer of, let's say, Chubb, uh, they are bringing a lawsuit against uh, Chubb on behalf of all policyholders. Um, that's called a class action. There are lot, just lots of different actions being brought in state court, federal court. Uh, depending on the individual policy, somewhat dictates our recommendation as to which strategy to deploy, whether we've brought class action cases, we've brought, brought individual state action cases, and we brought federal action cases through various states throughout the country. So um, it's a individual specific uh, strategy decision, but those are really the three options. How about with regard to Massachusetts, is there anything unique to Massachusetts? I know that we have a consumer protection statute and we also have an insurance bad faith statute that puts us in good standing to take on the insurance companies when they improperly deny coverage. But has anybody uh, seen what's unique about Massachusetts versus what people may have heard about in other states in fighting these cases? I, I think Massachusetts um, has given um, the policyholder and their lawyer a good set of tools compared to other places uh, in terms of uh, uh, getting paid quickly because you know when you talk about things like bad faith it's basically it's a penalty okay um, and it, var it varies by state but okay so if, if they don't pay and they found that they owe you the money then you get double trouble trouble type damages under certain circumstances uh, or have to pay the other side's costs and all this that's that just makes that just puts pressure on the insurance company to go back and make sure they're, they're, they really believe they're making the right decision and to focus on your unique policy situation and your unique set of facts. And uh, it's, you know, it's part of the process of going back to um, a company, maybe after denial and saying, well, look, we're going to, here's a, here's your, here's your 30, 30, 60 day notice letter. Right. Um, and you're on the hook and then the clock's ticking for them. Um, I, I often like to have uh, uh, plaintiffs sort of put together their damages proof of loss early. Uh, and I know Jeff's going to talk about, you know, the proof of loss and timing issues. But, um, you know, if you're going to take on the insurance companies, you should realize that from day one, when you file your first notice of claim, they're in litigation. Um, and they're doing everything that they can to, to, you know, protect their position, even though, really they should be trying to honor the contract. Uh, and I, I often feel that that's not the case, but um, so Massachusetts is well, well uh, positioned, I think, for people to protect their, their rights under insurance contracts. Great. Um, just one, before I turn it over to asking for questions from the audience, I know that you talked about a contingency fee can you share with everybody 
does that contingency fee also include are the costs contingent, the cost to fight the case against the insurance company? So I, I can answer that. We, we actually give uh, clients the option. If they want to pay the costs, they can pay the costs. Uh, if they want us to pay the costs, we'll pay the costs. And you may say, well, of course, then I would want you to pay the costs. Well, the only difference is it's not in the percentage of the contingency. It's solely when the contingency is calculated. So if, if we pay the costs, then the contingency is uh, from the total amount received, and then we recover back our contingency. If you re if you pay the the costs, we refund those costs up front, uh, and then our contingency fee is taken from the balance. So it's really it's really a choice. Thanks. Oh, one wild card. Um, uh, were you going to talk about uh, proof of loss? Uh, Jeff, a couple yeah. of uh, sure, go ahead. Yeah, and, you know, and just you know, the limitations, the whole claim section, I think is kind of important. Yeah, I think that Alan, Andrew and I and Mark have been fielding calls as we should from so many clients that we've got involved with because they're getting requests from the carrier to exchange in a dialogue. And as Alan says, you're in litigation from the moment that you put the claim in. Uh, and so everything you write back to them, everything you agree to talk to them on the phone, which is typically recorded, uh, like they say in the movies, Canon will be used against you. So we're very careful in advising how um, our clients should be talking, uh, responding. And we're also been uh, very watchful by reviewing the policies uh, enough times, not only to get the substance of what's there, but to make sure there aren't any nitpicking proof of loss uh, requirements that require within a certain time period, usually sh uh, in some cases, short time periods, 90 days, 120 days, uh, 60 days from the loss, which a lot of people calculate from March on, although it's our position, it's still ongoing. Um, there are a lot of nitpicky things to have to deal with up front and to make sure that you're crossing your T's and dotting your I's. Um, so, they're not easy to work with these policies to begin with. You read them, it's like gobbledygook in Greek. Uh, and when you start breaking them down, the things that you need trained professionals for to see if there's any special proof of loss requirements. That, that, that's kind of the upfront uh, material we're working with initially. Um, I have a question here that composed. Are we, you know, there's cases being filed across the country. So the question is, in Massachusetts, are we waiting to hear what happens in other states, or are we going to affirmatively move forward in litigation here in Massachusetts? Oh, we're not. Massachusetts would be crazy to wait on other states, okay? Yeah. Because um, the insurance industry can pick their fights, but they're not going to pick their first fight in Massachusetts. They're going to go to you know Michigan, uh, New York State, which where the law is not as evolved. Um, and they're going to try to find a lawyer who's not that experienced. And so there will, I can almost guarantee you that there'll be eight, nine, ten headlines that somebody got their case thrown out somewhere in the United States and just stay the course. I mean, if you've got a good claim and you've got Massachusetts law, you know, let's wait and see what Massachusetts courts have done. Yeah, we're bringing Massachusetts cases in Massachusetts and not waiting for to find out what they do in uh, Missouri. We really don't care what they do in Missouri as relates to the Massachusetts claim. And if anybody has questions, just type it at the uh, Q&A at the bottom of the screen. We're happy to answer them. We were asked uh -huh. ahead of time to kind of fly through this, which this was a real, real uh, overview. I put my, you can see my uh, email right uh, below. Feel free to email me or Mark. Uh, and we'll always follow up. I'm trying to answer the questions that they're posted. Why did I pose them so everybody can hear them quickly? Okay. Sure. Uh, what, so the email address, one of the person asked what email should we send it to? You could send it to mark, M-A-R-C, at dillerlaw.com, and I'll be circulating it through to the rest of the group. So it's M-A-R-C at D-I-L-L-E-R-L-A-W.com. Another question 
by Dana was, is the contingency fee paid the same for a settlement and litigation? And if there is an appeal as a result of litigation, does the contingency fee cover that cost? You want to just answer yeah, I, that out loud for the people who are who are going to be watching on recording? Yeah, uh, Jeff, you want to handle that? I'm sorry, I was reading the, one of the other questions. I didn't hear you. Sorry. On on the uh, Mark, read it again if you don't mind. Yeah. So the question was, is the contingency fee paid the same for settlement and litigation? And if there is an appeal as a result of litigation, does the contingency fee cover that cost? We're, we're using a scale um, where we have um, one set number of 25% of any amount recovered before any filed motions or the lawsuit, 35% of any amount recovered after filing any motion or lawsuit, and 40% of any amount recovered if the dispositive motion has been filed or within 90 days of trial. So the answer to the question is we have a sliding scale depending on what point we are, when we resolve it. We're hoping if it's possible we could get some of these resolved before uh, we even put them in suit. We're also very realistic that that probably won't happen in most cases, and some it might, uh, but in most of it won't. Um, and so the answer is, as a restaurant owner or operator, you have nothing to lose. If we don't recover, you don't owe us anything. If we, It's only if we recover, and I think in most cases, because for the, for the, the reality is this is not going to come quickly and it's not going to come easily, so when it does come, I think people will be happy to pay the attorneys for putting two years, three years of our blood, sweat, and tears into trying to get the results that we're willing to get. Uh, and obviously, just from a business perspective, as lawyers, we don't want to stay with the case for two to three years, put our own money and expenses in it if we don't think we can recover. So we need to be, as Andrew said, very upfront, very candid with our clients and let them know it's a contingency basis because we've chosen to take on the case and we're hopeful that they'll be recovered. Great, thanks. There's another question that was posed was, what is the process to have our firm file the claim letter and is the fee waived as you take a contingency? As it relates to the fee waiver, a contingency fee is the fee, so there's no upfront costs. You know, you're not paying a retainer to the lawyer for a fee. So the contingency fee is the fee agreement. But the question is, what is the process to have our company file the claim letter? You, you call your agent, uh, tell them you want to file a claim, where, get the address where you mail it to, and, you, and it's right in your policy as well. It'll say where, how to give notice and where, and you just mail it to them. I would encourage you, uh, make sure you have a copy and mail it certified mail or email. Sometimes and I think the question was posited as to whether or not we could file it, the claim on their behalf. Are we able to file it on their behalf? It's something we can help you with the language, but it's always better just coming straight from you. And the, this, the, we're happy to give you an email as relates to the language that should be in there. Just send us an email. Um, and then here's a question from Kara um, says, Growing up in hurricane country, my experience is that if the insurance industry is left solely on the hook for such a widespread loss, then insurance for all our small businesses in the future will go up significantly, just like we've seen property owners in hurricane phone areas. This means in the future, only the most well capitalized will be able to afford to open a storefront. What do you recommend is the best way for local chambers in Massachusetts to advocate for the best long term? beneficial outcome to the small business restaurant industry? The best way is to stay organized the way you have with the Massachusetts Restaurant Association. And that's why these associations are so important uh, because they become your uh, legislative voice uh, and should lobby for you uh, for that exact and get uh, legislative uh, help because they can't, it, it's really going to the Department of Insurance for the state of Massachusetts to make sure that there are caps and limitations on what, how, the, how much a particular insurance company can increase their rates. They don't get to just pick willy-nilly what rates they're going to charge. It's, it is uh, highly regulated. 
but what they rarely hear from are policy holders in that process. So that's where the Massachusetts Restaurant Association can be your advocate and voice as to why uh, those premiums should not be increased. Thanks. There's a question here about is the mass legislator drafting a bill to address this issue? I'll answer that. I know that there is a bill pending, but it's believed um, from good sources that it's very unlikely to ever get anywhere. And so the only recourse would be to go directly through the insurance company. So I see a question here, what would be the procedure if, our if we filed our claim and it has been rejected by the insurance company about two months ago? Uh, so the process is have an attorney review it. We're happy to do it. We have to review your policy and the de denial letter. But make sure if you look in that denial letter, if they're asking you to do something, provide certain information that you in fact do it. But the technical next claim is, uh, from a legal perspective, is to start a lawsuit. From uh, outside the uh, uh litigation is to speak to the adjuster and to negotiate with them, which is something that we would do. Right. Um, you know, respectful of everybody's time, is there any other questions that anybody in the audience has? I think I've addressed all of them, but if not, please send it through now so we can try to help answer those. Okay. Okay, great. Right. Well, Steve, I really appreciate Bob. I see you there as well. Thank you very much for having us here. We appreciate everything that the Mass Restaurant Association has been doing for the industry. I know that they've been working tirelessly to try to help them navigate all the obstacles that everybody's faced since the pandemic. So, um, you can, anybody can reach out to me at Mark at Dillala, M-A-R-C at Dillala.com. I'm in touch with this group of experts on a regular basis, and we can answer any questions that you have related to this. Um, so no problems. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mark, Alan, Andrew, Jeff. Thank you very much. Uh, for those of you that would like to copy this webinar, we should have it up on the website later on today or tomorrow morning, and that will conclude our MRA webinar on business interruption insurance. Thanks so much. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Stay safe.